<laughs> okay, so the question is, was Socrates guilty of corrupting the youth? And was Socrates guilty of not believing in the city's gods? Okay, so we'll start with um, the question of corrupting the youth. And I will read Mia's because she can't talk. <laughs> so I better read it right or it's going to be, you know, she's going to be going. So. Personally, I think Socrates was in fact not corrupting the youth. He was merely encouraging them to be curious about why things are the way they are. He simply wanted to teach a more complex and independent way of thinking. He's a philosopher, someone who questions the world and its ways. However, in this time period, the definition of corruption was to essentially question the gods, or to be impious. Moreover, to accomplish this method of teaching, he humiliated a respected member of his Athenian society, which is disrespectful. Thus, his method of teaching creates corruption toward the youth. Okay. All right, so question there is, did, did he deliberately humiliate them or did they humiliate themselves because he couldn't answer their questions? Um, so Mia, you can clock in on that if you want. Otherwise, we'll go to the other students and then maybe they'll, well, that'll be a follow-up question, okay? Um, okay, um, Michael, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I don't think that he is guilty of corrupting the youth uh, because all he did was, did was question them and make them question what they had been learning in a society. Um, and then uh, I just think that that obviously aggravated the people who uh, who disagreed. Uh, not the people who did, but the people, the higher ups in the in the society themselves, obviously did not think in the way that. Socrates did, and then with him forcing these other people to start questioning the people who are about to be the leaders in the society, obviously they did not like that. Um, and then what was the second, the second part was? Uh, Actually, we'll just start with corrupting. Yeah, we'll just start with corrupting. Um, anybody wanna chime in? You can at any time, Any um, Jack. Uh, I don't think he was guilty of corrupting the youth. Um, I think he was pointing out religious corruption as he saw it. And he was um, just stating like the truth and the leaders in the society didn't want to hear that. So they persecuted him for it. Okay. Um, so again, the question is, did he state something or did he just stand back and watch them shoot themselves in the foot, right? Right. And just say, gee, it seems like you didn't answer my question, right? Is that, it, you have to be kind of careful because he definitely was accused of teaching the youth something, mm -hmm. but he doesn't ever what, right? He's not teaching them anything. He's, the people themselves are getting exposed. And he, I don't think he said, I'm going to expose the corruption of this person. Yeah. I think it's just, okay, so you're a politician and you're, you're supposed to know about justice. So what is justice? That's a perfectly innocent question, isn't it? <laughs> when you graduate from here and someone says, okay, you have this hoity-toity piece of paper, so tell me, are you wiser because you have that piece of paper? How are you wiser? <laughs> Is that gonna be hard? Well, you should think about it, right? How are you going to, here's the question. Okay, so you got this fancy degree. Tell me why you'll be a better employee and you should get more money and a better job because you have that piece of paper, right? That's a fair question, isn't it? <laughs> I hope you think so. 
Um, okay, Melanie. Um, I don't think Socrates was corrupt. I think he, I agree with everyone. I think he saw corruption or what he felt was corruption based on his opinion of how society should have been run. Um, and I think he just, he was a very intelligent um, person. So I think he tried to get people to follow in his footsteps and kind of see, um, like agree with his opinion, I guess. Um, and I think that when, sometimes when you question people and they know that they're doing something wrong or that they know um, that you're proving them wrong, they get defensive. Um, and maybe that's where they came off as humiliated. Maybe they humiliated themselves that way, not being able to answer the questions. You know, I don't know, but that's just my opinion. Well, do people blame the messenger? A lot of times they do. <laughs> do you think that's what goes on? He's just the messenger or he just uh, exposed something? Yeah, I think that not necessarily he was the messenger, but he was the first person to challenge um, what their society was being run on. And not a lot of people had heard an opposing opinion before. All right, so you guys, did you guys get the no child left behind curriculum or something? Or not, I mean, it sort of went through the pipeline and then Obama came in and it was the core or whatever. Uh, so do you think, just do you think you got an education that was mostly propaganda designed to get you to fit into society and value what the higher ups think will improve the society? Or do you think you were given an education for critical thinking because the society thinks the only way to have a good society is for citizens that constantly examine each other and themselves and be willing to answer, why do I do this? Why do I do that? And not, not just say, I'm gonna do it because I have the power to do it. So do you think you were given an education that pointed out you have to be a critical thinker to, to preserve a democracy? Or do you think you were given an education to conform because we want a unified society and we want allegiance, loyalty? Um, what do you think, Michael? What are the arguments one way or the other? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that like the education system and well, I wouldn't say that the education, the education system in place is for us to necessarily fit in, um, like make one just uniform society. Um, although there are pieces of it that could definitely be improved. So can you give examples of you know, did it somehow happen somewhere between kindergarten and 12th grade that your teacher started to encourage you or give you opposing points of view? You know, somewhere it's a transitional process. Or was it coming to Lion? Was that a, a leap forward in encouraging you? Or what do you think? Um, I'm sorry, give me one second, Dr. Bain. That's okay, we can go to Jack. Um, what um, kind of education do you think you got? I definitely think Lion definitely fosters more like critical thinking, like gives you more freedom of thought. And in high school, it was more so like, um, well, definitely in STEM classes, you're, you're basically just taught to, to conform to what you're, what you're taught. I mean, but in English, English classes, I guess we were given more freedom, like at Lyon. 
Okay. And which courses does our society think is going to save us? It's going to make us richer. The STEM for sure. <laughs> That's where the honor is, right? That's where the money is. Mm. Um, the question is, do those humanities teachers, are they unpatriotic and uh, atheist, right? It is a debate though, right? Um, no? Okay, Michael, what, what do you say? Um, no, I was just gonna add, I feel like, uh, I mean, I went to like a pretty small public school in Arkansas and there's, there's not a whole lot of room for uh, differing, differing like points of view. Um, and I feel like that that's probably something that you see uh, uh, geographically, like throughout the US. I feel like, you know, you go from here to a uh, school in DC, you know, there's, it's, it's going to be pretty different. Um, and then that probably like the, the first time that like I was like asked to like challenge my own viewpoint was probably at Lyon because I just feel like teachers in high school aren't really looking for you to necessarily challenge a, a viewpoint rather just learn the viewpoint that they're teaching. Can you explain what happened? What did the teacher tell you or ask you to do? Oh, at Lyon? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um... Well, that's okay. I'm just, I don't know if there was ever a certain point where you go, wow, this is different. Um, but if you think of it, you can come back to it. Uh, Melanie, how do you reflect back on your education? Um, so I, I guess I went to a Catholic school until seventh grade. So probably around seventh grade, I was like 12, 13 ish. That's when really my viewpoint started to be challenged because um, I'm from St. Louis, so it's a really big area. So I went to school, I went to public school with all kinds of different people. Um, and so I saw all kinds of different viewpoints. So I feel like that was really the transition for me was around then. Um, and then being at Lyon, I guess it's it has challenged my viewpoints a little bit more. I would say I've just learned a lot more about myself being here because I've met um, my closest friends here. Yeah, well, that's a standard thing is that you, you make your best friends at college because you're coming into your own and you actually have time. And it's not always people like at work. You know, once you get away from college, you get really put in some narrow, you know, you have to do well at work and you have to do this and that. Um, anyway, so, well, what about, I mean, recently, uh, Mia, did you wanna try to talk or type or just uh, listen for now? Um, um, I can kind of talk, so I don't know if you can hear me very well. We can hear. <laughs> okay. Um, like for me personally, um, I grew up in a very conservative area. <coughs> <coughs> and um, and um, so like everything was just very like, uh, like the way we learned history was very political and it was very like this is how like everything is supposed to be and like uh and so I don't know I just grew up with very limited I guess knowledge on like both sides of everything I just feel like I had very one-sided but I had like two teachers that kind of challenged that which was like English and it was in middle school and that started so look at that stop talking now my throat hurts <laughs> okay all right so you're living at a time when this has gotten very controversial with the 1619 project right 
and the recent election of the governor of Virginia. Um, and that might be a huge, uh, they're using focus groups right now to find out if they could get votes by making that a big controversy that um, liberals want to teach your kids to not be patriotic, to hate your country, um, because they want to, you know, look at the part of history that has been whitewashed, which would be slavery, right? So do you know about the 1619 Project? Oh, dear. Um, all right. I'll try to find, if you don't mind, I mean, you don't have to look at any of these posts, you understand? I don't want you to think that Dr. Beck is trying to put you in a box, okay? I, it has been controversial. Elections could be won or lost on the basis of this. So I do have some interviews with the woman who wrote the 1619 Project. Um, so it's just about when the first slave came. And so you're looking at American history from a broader lens. Um, but you never have to look at those, okay? Um, anyway, do you think your American history should include more of the story of slavery? Um, did you get American history in a way that implicitly had American exceptionalism, like we are God's country, or we're special, or we're different. Um, all I know is that my US history teacher had just gone to a seminar in Boulder, Colorado, and he had gotten this honor section. He was so excited to try these new methods, and it was critical thinking, and I loved it. But I like there's a whole lot of US history I don't know, you know, the standard test type stuff. Okay, so Mia got the God's country thing. Okay, Mia. I mean, it's just at that point, what, once you realize that, you just decide, right? You decide, what do I want to do? And you show, you know, you decide, do I want to read some other books that give a different perspective? Uh, Howard Zinn wrote a book called The People's History of the U.S. Right? It has the indigenous and the black and some things like that. Um, but that's up to you. It's just that it's still a question. That's all. Um, all right. So is it corrupting the youth to ask them to read a version of U.S. history that explains what white people did to Native Americans and the slave trade and how that functioned and the Civil War and being a little bit more honest and not sentimentalizing it, but not creating, you know, this huge black and white thing either. Um, but, you know, presenting it, I think I think it would have been more interesting if somebody had said to me, look, we're in Minnesota and the history books up here say that Lincoln was a good president, but there are history books or there are people in the South that point out that, that think Lincoln was a bad president. And then here's the reasons the Northerners in general think this, and here's the reasons there are a number of Southerners, again, I don't know, who think this. And, you know, that would just be an exercise in realizing how are we going to come together? How are we going to overcome this polarization? Um, okay. All right. So Mia's got a nice neighbor. Um, what do you think, Michael? Do you think? High school kids should be given a whole lot of points of view for them to think about? Um, I, I don't know if I would say a whole lot of points of view because I feel like it's kind of difficult to balance all of those and kind of decide for yourself what's right. Um, but obviously it's what's currently taught as a very one-sided uh, point of view and that it would be beneficial 
beneficial for everyone to have um, have something that's a little more true. Anybody else want to raise their hand or clock in? Because I can. I'll just keep asking questions. So. Yeah, I think more Native history should be included, especially in like the Indian Removal Act. Okay. Um, yeah, the other thing that I think is interesting is the idea that government's always the problem and it should stay out of the way when it was the government that literally created these homesteads, kicked the natives off. I mean, <laughs> the white people got their wealth right from their little homestead and that was government that determined all of that so the government very much intervened in the original wealth you know the way wealth was generated does that everybody understand that i mean it's <laughs> you just have to reconsider these assumptions that we keep getting fed um let's see i was going to ask Anyway, so the, I, oh yeah, do people, when somebody does want to expand, do they get called corruptors of the youth and unpatriotic? Um, I mean, I would hope not. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, my next question, who, what, what should we do to overcome the polarization? Because again, I should ask you that every day because that is a huge problem, right? And it's going to be such a huge problem for you as you step up and start governing the society. I mean, 20 years when you're about 40s, when you sort of take out on the big position, but I mean, you have, it takes 20 years, I think, to overcome this polarization. So. What do you, do you, first of all, can I assume that everyone wants to think about how to go forward with less polarization? Is there anybody who doesn't think that's important? Okay. So then the question is how, right? So I'll ask you one more question, then we'll get on to the atheist or not. Do you think teaching the Native American side and the African American side will reduce polarization? Or do you think politicians will use it to make polarization worse? Or what do you think should be done in terms of that issue and the problem of polarization? What do you think, Michael? Um, I don't know. I don't either. It's a toughie though, right? Right, right. Because typically we have like people living in like areas and those like people are going to have like ideals. So you don't really get, uh, you know, you can have polarization from the media and still, and still in your own home have a different thought. However, like, we tend, I don't know, I don't know, especially when you think about schools and stuff, again, like where, like where I went to school, like my English teacher also went to my high school and my uh, science teacher went to my school before it was consolidated. And like, so these people are just in the same area. They're always in the same area. They're never, they're never like learning anything different, I guess. Did you did your science teacher tell you evolution was optional or you should accept creation or evolution? Um, no, she she taught evolution. Um, okay, that is optional though now for biology teachers in Arkansas, I think. Is it? I think so. I think that law the law gets introduced and then I I don't wait long enough. It's just been introduced anyway. I don't know if it got passed, but. Um, what about you, Jack? Can you think of whether this would polarize or not, or what? I don't. I don't think polarization is going to get any better anytime soon. I, I think it. Like honestly, I think it stems back all the way to the Civil War. Like I think there's just two different like 
ideals that I think, um, I don't think that it's gonna improve anytime soon, honestly. Do you think there's anything you can do about it? I, I, all I'm doing is, I don't want you to have to, you know, run that kind of a society. So for your sake, you know, uh, can you, you know, create, just be creative and think of ways that somehow you could make it not so bad. I don't know. Okay, it is a creative activity though. I, you know, trying to build bridges. Mm -hmm. Just again, for your sake, I would encourage you to think about it um, because everybody suffers when that happens. Okay, um, Melanie? Um, I would love to get to a place where these things don't have to be taught or talked about in school where we don't have to include um, like race, racial things being an issue. But unfortunately, these things are still so recent um, and they still affect decisions that are being made today. Um, so they have to be taught. I mean, they have, they still have to be talked about. Um, and I think I just have to hope that my generation wants society to change as much as I do and is willing to compromise with everybody else's opinion as well as their own. Um, but I, I don't think polarization, unfortunately, I don't think it's gonna end any time that I'm alive, but hopefully, <laughs> okay. hopefully it will get better. Okay, so when I was your age, there was some African American male stuff, and I read autobiography of Malcolm X. I read a lot of books by African American males, and I wrote a paper for my U.S. history class, and I still remember it was about the Civil Rights Movement. There was nothing by African American women, and so now, and Latino people are going to be writing stuff. I mean, I'm just all for it. I think it's great, um, but the genie's out of the bottle in the sense, like there's too much out there. And so now, you know, you're, nobody is accidentally not teaching it because they didn't know it was there, right? Nobody is innocent in this issue. So then, um, so there's enough, non-white people who know that the stuff is there who want a voice and they want to be part of the narrative and there's white people who want them to be part of the narrative and then there's people who don't right and so um the question is how can you use it right some people would think this is a great way to build the bridge is everybody's everybody's an American and everybody helps build the bridge. We're all, you know, fundamentally the same. We have the same needs. But on the other side, you know, the issue can be used to polarize. So I guess, you know, one thing you could do is just call out someone who's trying to use it deliberately to polarize and to get votes because that would be intellectually dishonest. Does that make sense? It's just dishonest. Does, does that make sense to you? That, you know, refusing to see something that's right in front of your face. Um, and then learn patience with complexity and ambiguity, fairness to opposing points of view. So I do think the lion um, characteristics of a liberally minded person would promote diversity of education. But again, you always listen to the other side. And if they have a reason you respect, reason dissent, um, that's fine. Okay, so now, is Socrates an atheist? Michael. Um. I wouldn't say that he's an atheist, but 
it's definitely thought that like he he did not like he definitely did not support the idea of having gods especially plural um like not necessarily support i don't think that he was against it but it was he definitely did not uh believe in plural gods um in what like multiple multiple gods oh, okay right um like uh, like like Athens did like in the old gods I mean I guess yeah um but I would not I would not say that he's a complete atheist no I think that he believed in some sort of divine uh entity okay um Jack yeah I agree I do think he I do think he believed in the gods um but uh, I think he wa he wanted to question. He wanted to not believe in a black and white, like believe the laws of the gods. I think he wanted more of a gray area where people could question and kind of create their own rule of law. Okay. That goes back to, is it pious because the gods love it or do they love it because it's pious? Remember that? Right, yeah. Okay, good. Um, Melanie. Um, I don't think I would consider him an atheist exactly, um, because I wouldn't consider myself an atheist, and I don't know that I necessarily believe that there is a God. Um, so I don't know. I don't really know what I would call Socrates. I don't know if he had a faith, I guess. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to be Socrates, right? My chance. All right, so then I'm going to ask you, you know, you have to react to Socrates. You have to ask him a question or something. Okay, so you just read um, a transcript from my defense of my way of life in front of the Athenian jury. So I want to explain my life, uh, Athens, and then how it was that I ended up uh, dying because of those accusations. So, all right, I think I was the greatest gift Athens had because my way of life was what the founders, Solon and all the people, the wise people who set up the society in the first place, they knew that if you're going to preserve the rule of law, and if you're going to have a stable middle class, that the citizens need to be engaged in public life. They need to know what's going on in the assembly, and they need to know what's going on in the courts. They need to come on Saturday to the marketplace and go look at the postings about that and then go talk to their fellow citizens. They need to come to the religious festivals and watch the tragedies and then go down to the taverna and talk to other people about their thoughts about the characters and the choices. Partly because they need to cultivate their own judgment they might have decided, gee, I hadn't thought about it that way. I think I'm wrong. I think I'm going to change my mind. But partly because they need to know, my gosh, some of the Athenians really are authoritarians. They don't have a democratic spirit. They're not fair to opposing points of view. They really want power. And they're using the this, this system to get it. Like, I was at the Agora today, and we were discussing the, the court case. And just for example, right, I was there, I don't know, four years ago. And um, somebody said, well, that person didn't hire a good enough lawyer. Like, the reason they lost was that that they didn't have enough money to pay a lawyer that would manipulate the jury. Um, or somebody else would say, well, I was on a jury and this arrogant 
uh, defendant didn't even make me feel pity toward him. You know, he was just being so unemotional that I became annoyed and I voted against him. Well, <laughs> like the founders would go, wait, wait. The whole point of being in a jury is to be a detached observer, is not to make judgments based on emotion, is to call out that kind of rhetoric. Don't let yourself be manipulated. And, and so, you know, I got into a discussion with them and I said, wait a sec, that's not what our founders wanted. Um, that's the way people corrupt the system. And, and I'm not sure any of them changed their mind. As a matter of fact, I think they got mad at me for saying that because I'm telling them they're not a good citizen, but they're free to decide whatever they want. So I was telling them, you're not free to decide whatever you want. You're not free to make judgments on whatever you feel like. And of course, they didn't want to hear that. And so they're accusing me of not being patriotic and not loving Athens. I mean, oh my gosh, it was, I was just a stone cutter. And I fought in the wars when I was recruited. And I am not afraid of death because I think that's totally irrational. You don't know, you know, what comes after. You don't know if it's good, if you got killed in the battle or not. All you know is, you know, you're going to go, you're going to do what you're asked to do. But for me, it was a lot more important. As soon as I got back from the war, I went back out the, uh, there in the Agora because I knew if people are irrational and greedy and power hungry, we're just going to have one war after the other because people are going to use war to get power and they're going to send their sons off or they're going to use war to gain money or they're going to just um, be resentful of other city states if they cross them and the Athenians think they're powerful enough, they'll just go get them. I mean, it was really crazy. It was nothing like the founders wanted to develop practical wisdom. And so, uh, and I did speak up because I thought that's my duty as a citizen to try and get them to examine themselves and each other. Um, so then every once in a while, I would get invited to a house of an aristocrat. And it, then I was, that's a great honor. So people with authority uh, were at the house and we did talk about the serious questions. And again, I was really surprised that they didn't seem to understand that the public trusted them with a really serious kind of power and they should use it for the benefit of the ruled and not just to help their friends and harm their enemies. So, but I just thought I got to keep going. And then Carafon went to the Delph, to the Oracle and asked, is there anyone wiser than me? And the oracle said, no, and I was like, what? But then I figured out, you know, the oracle, what didn't say I was wise, the oracle just said, there's no one wiser. And so I really did decide the only reason I'm wise is that I don't think I know. So what I think, if justice really is leading your city weaving together the rich and the poor, creating a strong middle class, not allowing the city to go to war for power, not to allow the power hungry people to take over the city, not to allow the money hungry people to engage in expansion uh, and empire building. If that's what justice is, I don't know. Because I, when I get up in the morning, I don't know what people are going to say. I don't know if my response is going to lead them to make better judgments. 
And it's those judgments that are what justice is. Justice is how people behave, what they choose and why. So how, how would I know? And then the decision one day, you know, things will change and two weeks later, there'll have to be different decisions made. So, I mean, it's this process of constantly examining and then saying, well, uh, according to what I know at the moment, this is why I think this is the best way for the city to flourish over time. Um, you just try and you keep examining, like that's it. <laughs> but of course that isn't what justice is actually making the decision. All I do is I try to put myself in a frame of mind where I'm most likely to actually make a good judgment. And in some sense, that is what justice is to be a good citizen, but also because it will lead to better judgments or it's more likely to. Um, so I knew that long before Athens lost its democracy, physically, literally, and, and uh, Critias got elected, we lost it spiritually. So Athens was based on this view that in order for people to be truly human and in order for them to live meaningful lives and human beings want their lives to be meaningful, they want to leave something behind and democracy is where they would want to leave a stable society behind. But the corruption of that is people who really just want to leave behind a pile of money to show that they won the economic war, or they want to leave an empire, right? That they, they um, amassed power over other people, but that's not democracy. A, a true Democrat would want to leave behind a flourishing society that has a reputation for being fair to other city states so that it's not going to be attacked and also not to attack. So, um, so nobody seemed to have the democratic spirit. So we lost it and we didn't even know we lost it people believed that the freedom meant freedom to live however you like. So whenever I questioned what they were doing, then I was not being a Democrat. I was being unpatriotic because I was implicitly telling them, no, <laughs> that's not what democracy is about. Um, they had lost what Solon had in mind and what um, all the others who refined the system had in mind had been lost. Um, the other, when I was accused of not believing in the city's gods, if you remember, um, they said I called the sun a stone um, and the moon. Remember when I said that there were those natural scientists who were out on the islands who were speculating about the nature of the universe because they thought it had a natural cause and it was based on cause effect. So their big insight was that the universe is ordered and intelligible and we're capable of understanding the basic foundation of that order. So, you know, um, why would they accuse me of that? Anaxagoras had his theory, but there were a lot of theories out there. And then Pericles, the great democratic leader, Anaxagoras was one of his friends that used to hang out at his house, you know? So, um, but that's worrisome. It was worrisome that there were enough people in Athens who thought either agreed that all those people were atheists and they're all going to hell and I'd love to give them all the hemlock. Or they thought by taking Socrates to court and accusing him of that, they would be able to win the case, right? 
there were enough Athenians who were threatened by speculation about natural causes that I would lose my case. But again, that goes against, that's what freedom was. It was free intellectual inquiry. It was free inquiry into cause effect. That's what gave us such a, a leg up on the sciences and medicine. That's what gave us, you know, we had, we built great ships, our technology, all that stuff was because we had free minds to invent things. Um, the other thing that worried me was um, that the artists were the creators of the story. They were the storytellers, but all of that artwork really is designed to get you to think twice about all of your blind faith. There are characters there that have blind faith that are clearly mistaken, and the audience can see that. And there are characters that have blind patriotism, like the herald in Agamemnon of Aeschylus, he says, ah, we won the war, Agamemnon is God. He's so great, he's Mr. Perfect, he's the most powerful man. And then he comes home and he's just a jerk. You know, <laughs> he's, he's so full of himself. And I mean, it's obvious that you're not supposed to blindly accept your leader, but somehow the Athenians had lost track of the messages of their artists. And that was another thing that was very amazing about Athens is you could have free artistic expression and the artists would write things that would undermine blind patriotism, blind allegiance to family. It would expose all of those thoughtless, unexamined ways of living because democracy depended on an examined life. Um, yeah, let's see, what else? Oh, so I could tell you the historical. Um, all right, so the tragedy, do you remember the sophists? Um, the sophists were foreigners who came and they, they were paid by the wealthy. So, okay, our founders just wanted everyone to keep developing their capacity for examination. But then foreigners came and started teaching the art of rhetoric, the art of persuasion. And that was going to corrupt the legal system and the assembly. But it got even worse when he charged for it, right? I mean, it would have been bad enough if they just went over to the agora, but at least everybody could have learned it or everybody could have learned that was going on and they could learn how to watch out for it. But when it started to be private lessons, then the best and brightest, the richest are getting these techniques that the public is not going to recognize because they, they're not learning uh, what techniques are used and why. So, so the sophists came, you know, more and more came because they said, hey, there's a lot of money to make here in Athens. And more, they had more and more influence. And so the great irony was that the public who voted against me thought that I was a sophist. At the very beginning of the apology, I point that out. You know, it was the people who've been accusing me for decades, and they will accuse me of having fancy rhetoric. I don't have fancy rhetoric. If I'm persuasive, it's because what I see is true. And it, it triggers, right? People know in the backs of their minds that they're corrupt, but they don't want to hear it. And so they will accuse me of using fancy rhetoric. But that's exactly what the sophists did, not me. But everybody does that, right? They want to find a scapegoat. They don't want to examine themselves. They want to find someone to blame for their problems. But that's why tragedy, it was called the goat song. 
that's literally what it means because it's about scapegoats and it's about don't do this, don't do that. It was so beautiful the way our society was set up and the Athenians corrupted it so badly. It just made my heart ache. Um, so I was confused as a sophist and that was the great tragedy of the fall of Athens was that the, there were the wicked people, clearly the ones who wanted their children just to get wealthy and powerful and the sophists who were perfectly willing to oblige. And then there was me and you know other people, I wasn't the only one trying desperately <laughs> to talk them out of it or to expose it or just to try to cultivate critical examination. And then there were the ones in the middle, the ones on the jury. And the key was whether they, which direction would they go? So it was a struggle for the souls of the Athenians and the soul of the city. So the tragedy was they made the wrong choice. And so Plato realized when he got, after he was young, when these things happened, he looked back and he said, you know what? Every society that has free artistic expression, free intellectual inquiry, citizen engagement in public life, journalism, right, it's, you know, people are informed about public affairs, every society like that, the citizens have to cultivate this critical thinking or the people who want money and power will be able to destroy it and take over. So Plato wrote these dialogues. It doesn't matter if you're in a monarchy or an aristocracy where you have inherited privilege or a democracy, what matters is that the people in charge or the people who want to be in charge understand you must rule for the sake of the rules. You must educate yourself. You must educate your people in order to preserve stability and flourishing. And if you don't, if you try to wrap the society around your finger, it will become unstable. You will have a civil war, right? Uprising of the poor, or you will have power struggles among the powerful. And then some strongman dictator will come in and say, I'll fix it. I can control all this. And the masses will vote for him because they're so destabilized. And you'll lose everything, everything that makes life worth living. So Plato realized he lived through a paradigm and he wrote these dialogues. He started a school because he thought that was so important that we, we really become fully human. We cultivate all these capacities we have for higher order culture and we avoid the corruption. Um, and he's showing how Athens failed but the readers of his dialogues don't have to fail. Like they can learn the lessons. And that's basically the only hope for humankind. Because if human beings don't think critically, it's guaranteed that they'll live under an authoritarian society because there's too many power hungry people that will take advantage of their desire to be told things. You have to want to live with complexity and ambiguity if you want to maintain a free and open society. Nobody's going to have all the answers, but you do have to keep pursuing the best judgment at the time. Okay, now the other thing I wanted to ask you about was those newspaper articles, right? So I think I gave you a couple of them to read. Um, let's see, here we go. Big brains, small minds. There were lots of articles here about the difference between STEM and the humanities, right? And then um, 
Plato knew. I mean, this to me is amazing, right? Because I'm just reading whatever, the Chronicle of Higher Ed, and this guy talks about Plato. <laughs> um, so I hope, you know, you went, wait a sec, people still know this stuff. Um, and then, uh, okay, there's that one. Then there was the one about how the humanities can fix things. Um, so there's that one for you to think about if you had a reaction to that. Oh yeah, I mean, this is so incredible. And Mr. Rulier actually teaches about Germany before Hitler, the rise of Hitler. Consider this, is it possible to have a society full of young people or creative, energetic, entrepreneurial, technologically informed and wholly comfortable with mass slaughter? It was like, yeah, the Germans. So you need to remember that the Germans were really high tech people at that time. That's how they could run the Holocaust. They had to be really good engineers, you know, get those trains running, get all that stuff built. And so, so he, this person teaches Germany for a lot of the same reasons that I teach um, Athens. And Mr. Rulier and I were just sort of spiritual and intellectual buddies. We used to talk about that because he's been my colleague for about 20 years. And then there's the problem with the academy. It's gotten way too intellectual. People just intellectualize about things. And that's really unfortunate. We get rewarded for that. If you had uh, gone to a research university, you would probably have a professor that spends a lot more time talking to other professionals and publishing in journals that are irrelevant to students. But at liberal arts colleges, we're supposed to publish, but not as much. And we're supposed to connect our our scholarly work with teaching and a way of life. So you might never, you could talk to your, your other friends who go to college. Then there's what moderate what moderates believe. And um, okay, and then there was another one. Um, here we go. I think this is, yeah, analogies. Okay, this of campaigns and breakfast cereals on uh, Nixon, during Nixon's era, it said um, that the, the head of the campaign or said, you know, you don't want to bore the readers or viewers with anything too complicated. Just give them something simple and, and they'll, they'll be happy. Just make them happy. Um, don't make them uncomfortable. Of course, that's exactly, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable if you want to preserve a democracy. Um, and then Mr. Um, Brooks, and the date on this is very interesting because the date is um, April of 2001. So it's just a matter of months before September 9-11. So, and he, he notices right then that nobody takes time to think, to stand back and reflect. And that doesn't mean you have to do it alone. That's what, when people go to the tragedy and go down to the taverna and have a conversation, that should trigger that thinking. And you would go home probably thinking because you'd have this weird conversation with somebody. I know that happens to me, you know, those ideas get stuck in my head. Um, so each of you should um, clock in on which of those you wanted to comment on. So Michael, did you have a comment on one of those? Um, yeah, I, I can't remember, hold on. I think it was the second Chronicle of Higher Education one. It might have been the first, uh, but essentially they were kind of just discussing like how when you like in today's society, when you get a degree in, in the humanities and you kind of brought this up already as well, uh, but how when you get a degree in the humanities and you um, you kind of like 
start to like go out into the world, you try to get a job, it's kind of hard almost to justify in today's world with the current culture that is so uh, STEM, it's, it's so, uh, uh, I don't know, it's so uh, into, into STEM uh, that it talked about how it's kind of hard to get a job uh, with a humanities degree and to justify that degree, which I thought was interesting. Um, I think actually I'm, I've really liked the minor uh, to have kids major in something, psychology, anything, and then minor in RPH because the students tell me that RPH gives them, for example, their ideas for their, psycholog for their psychology research, right? They get their ideas or they'll take an advanced seminar paper from me, like one girl did a paper for me about the culture of rape and how so many things about the culture promote violence and aggression toward women. And then her research paper was about how women who are raped get PTSD, right? So I think, I think that's a nice way to put those together because when you're dealing with people with trauma, it's within a cultural context and how they think about whether God willed this or not, right? Makes a big difference to how they heal. Uh, does that make sense to you, Michael? That either students double major or they major in something else, or, you know, they're gonna go to seminary or something, but um, I don't encourage my students to starve just to be, just to starve, <laughs> you know, for the principle of it uh to be a martyr but anyway 70 percent of faculty now are adjuncts and that they never get time to think it's really sad uh it's it's really a problem um jack what about you did you read one of those um i like the example that socrates was talking about uh herodicus and he was talking about the um how he used all of his STEM knowledge to uh, buy, try to buy eternal youth to no avail. <laughs> <laughs> Arrogance, right? Yeah. Well, Jack, how many people make how much money trying to get old people whose bodies are trying to die stay alive, right? Yeah. The so irrational I fear of death is is destroying your generation like we're handing you this bill and you're going to have to you're going to be in a lot more debt and your children are going to be in debt because my generation is obsessed about using stem to live longer than our bodies really allow does that make sense jack mm. there's a it's lot of money really, keeping people alive or it's because you were fat, you didn't eat right, you get diabetes, you get heart disease, you have to have a hip replacement or, a, you know, anybody will pander to you, but there's no free lunch. You send the bill to your grandkids. Like, why would you want to do that? Right. But you have to think like a Democrat to think that way, right? If your individualism, it's second nature. It doesn't even occur to you. Um, all right, Melanie. Um, in the humanities article, I saw a line that said something about um, like some of this information could be like not useful for people in the real world, and I don't. I just think that's wrong. <laughs> um, I think a lot of those classes can teach can teach you just how the mind works and how people handle things and deal with things and react to things and that can help you tremendously throughout your life I mean even I'm just a business major but even um just knowing how people are going to react to things um helps me a lot <laughs> I know well, a lot know, about go ahead what would be really interesting would you take a marketing class and then you take a propaganda class <laughs> right mm -hmm. or you take yeah i mean so 
in some sense, some business wants, you know, it's basically sophistry. If you're selling people things they don't need and shouldn't buy, then you're just, you know. Yeah, you know, I'm, in, I'm in an anthropology course right now and that's really, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I think it's that combination of things that's really, really interesting. Um, so, so for next time, I will post on the next issue is Socrates goes to prison and he's sitting there and there had there been a religious festival so it took a while before they were going to kill anybody and then um, the ship started coming back so they knew he was going to get killed in a couple days. Crido comes and tries to spring him from prison. Says, okay, I got my buddies. They're out there waiting. They'll take you to Thessaly. I got connections in Thessaly. Get you and your family, get out of here and go take care of your family, right? And Socrates says, no. <laughs> all right. So go through all, the, first of all, figure out for yourself. What would I do if I were unjustly accused, right? I mean, most people have friends who probably try to get them out of it. What am I going to do? So I would, I would suggest that you think about that seriously before you read it. Um, and these things happen. Um, of course, the stereotype is that some poor old college kid gets falsely accused of rape, which, of course, happens very rarely, but it's this huge thing that the students always are talking about. Um, I think the statistic is maybe 8% of those accusations are questionable. And then of course, there's all the women that don't even try because of the way that women get demonized if they do. Um, that's all I know, but at least it it gives you this perception that you could get unjustly accused of something. Don't take it lightly. Like it could happen. It in your life, you will get unjustly accused of various things. You won't get it that extreme. You won't end up with a criminal record. But how do you deal with unjust accusations? Um, and then you. Um, then you can read and try to figure out what the arguments are. I, to me, these are the kinds of arguments you should have in your head all the time, the rest of your life. And the same with the apology, the voice of Socrates. You should have internalized it, right? You should naturally ask people follow-up questions. Um, and you should be aware that that you can't have a democracy unless you do. And incidentally, I'm a total hypocrite. I don't do that. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a coward for the most part. Um, so I, I won't, I don't wanna ask you to do something that I tend not to do. And the reason I justify it is most of those fights aren't worth fighting because it will polarize people more and not, I can't think of a constructive use of it, but that shouldn't be my business, you know, I should ask anyway. Socrates had a lot more courage than I did, but I do like to teach and get students to think about, well, what do you want? What kind of person do you want to be? And how do you want to live? And to be aware that everything you do has an impact on whether the democracy will become more stable or less stable. That's one thing that I want you to be aware of, that you are part of the society and you do have a responsibility. You can't ignore it. To be silent is to allow the really bad guys to take over because nobody stands in their way. Uh, does everybody understand that? Not to decide is to decide. Like you're deciding all the time how you want, what kind of a citizen you want to be. Um, all right, so that's it. It's nine 
what, 18? If anybody wants to stay, I will turn off the recording so that anything after that is private, you know, doesn't become public uh, property. And I'll post.